Welcome. I'm Father John Powers, your host for another segment in our discussion on prayer and styles of prayer, and our guest is Father Basil Pennington. Welcome, Basil. Thank you, John. Uh, maybe I could tell our audience a little bit about you. Uh, sure. Trappist monk, St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, has been a traveler around the world in lecturing and teaching in prayer forms, specifically in centering prayer. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, an author of a number of books, which perhaps mm -hmm. we'll mention again mm -hmm. uh, in this session. Um, but I wanted to ask you, first of all, in all of your travels, in, in all the spiritual direction you do, especially in the recent years, have you sensed a certain renewed hunger for God? Is there a significant change or...? or well, I would say that the, the change came about uh, quite a few years ago. People mm -hmm. began searching. What I think has been happening, though, is that um, while in the 60s, uh, the generally the young people of the West didn't look to their own roots, their own tradition, and so on. They kind of didn't see the fruit of it. They didn't uh, find liveliness in their churches and synagogues, and so they were looking more abroad. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, many masters coming in from other traditions into this country, especially, and they looked to them more uh, to find those deeper answers. But I think always that searching has been there. Uh, except in times of real crisis, like the times of the, of the war and, uh, or times of great affluence. But the problems, questions were rising, society was more unsteadily, uh, and people were searching for some deeper roots, and they why looked not, more to the East. Why not in their own tradition? Because they didn't, uh, many of them were brought up in, in churches and synagogues and weren't finding that real liveliness, the deep answers there, mm -hmm. and didn't see it in their parents' lives many cases. Uh, they didn't see the, uh, the parents find the answers in their churches and their synagogues. And so uh, they were looking more to these masters and east. Now what I've seen now is that is somewhat peaked and, and uh, while there are many still drawing from these traditions, the roots are in. You're looking, they're looking more in their own tradition mm -hmm. and wanting to find uh, in their own Christian uh, or Jewish uh, roots uh, traditions, uh, the deeper meanings, the answers. And uh, so I find them now uh, coming more to churches, to monasteries, uh, to uh, priests and religious saying, you know, what's our tradition? Uh, show us how to pray. Uh, they're, they're looking for the, even the traditional forms, more recent traditional forms, which we kind of laid aside, like the rosary and the uh, Stations of the Cross and uh, Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, and of course the Eucharist and the Sacraments. And so when you say younger people or mm -hmm. people are seeking uh, mm -hmm. with questions, looking for answers, are they seeking some intellectual material or experiential? Oh, experiential, or? definitely. They, they want to, to somehow uh, get in touch with the deeper meaning of life not just intellectually, but uh, fully, integrally, humanly, uh, you know, to have the experience of God. Uh, the kind of experience that some have found in the charismatic movement. Mm -hmm. uh, some are kind of turned off by the charismatic, and they're looking for it in, in some of the deeper and quieter ways that uh, they've seen people finding it in the East, or they found it in the East, and coming back to look for this in their own tradition. Uh, would you say that many of them, from your experience, are people who have not been able to find a, a sense of meaning in their work or in their in the life they've been leading with a sense of almost despairingly looking toward? Sometimes that. Sometimes uh, they have found a certain amount of meaning there, but it isn't enough. Mm -hmm. There needs to be something deeper, uh, more grounding, uh, more universal. Mm -hmm. I mean, today's uh, people are much more people of the global community. They've traveled more. They've been all over the world with TV. Uh, they have a sense, a deep sense, that you know this isn't going to work just in our country, mm -hmm. as big as it is. So uh, what may have been a ghetto to... mentality among denominations mm -hmm. or religious communities uh, was broken apart? Yes, that's certainly true. Uh, I think young people find it, it much easier uh, to be at home in different uh, Christian traditions, certainly, and even beyond that in, in other, other traditions, to draw what's good there, the experience. And yet at the same time, you know, they have a sense of they belong to a tradition and would like to see that, mm -hmm. that blossom. You too. mentioned some of the various traditional forms of mm -hmm. or styles of prayer, the rosary, 
uh, benediction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, for those people who don't know what you're talking about when you say the rosary mm -hmm. or benediction, maybe you can explain some of these different specific prayer forms before we get into talking about yeah. centering prayer. Well, for Catholics our age, you know, that seems like a strange question. I know. What Catholic doesn't know what the rosary is, a benediction? But it is true. I've had many uh, young people ask me. I remember one day I was walking along the street uh, with another priest, and I heard a clitter clatter behind us. We turned around, there were three young girls, and uh, they, they uh, were kind of excited and breathless, I was saying that she was trying to teach her two girlfriends to say the rosary, and she couldn't remember what the fourth and fifth glorious mystery were, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And uh, it just, this other, these other girls were eager to learn. Uh, the beads are in, you know, the beads in every tradition, and uh, so many uh, have never been taught at home or in school or in, uh, in uh, Sunday school or anything. And the rosary is a wonderful form of prayer. I mean, it, it has that quiet rhythm of repeating the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and so on, while you meditate deeply on the, the basic mysteries, or just be in them mm -hmm. until they come alive in you. And when I uh, published my first book on Centering Prayer, I sent it to my aunt, who was a very gifted woman. She was one of the highest women in AT&T before she retired. And I remember she wrote back to me and said, well, it was an interesting book, and she enjoyed it, but she'd stick with the rosary. <laughs> and the rosary led my mother into great holiness, I know. So, uh, but why, what happened form? to that prayer form that it became, so many people don't know about it, or younger people might not have ever experienced it? Yeah, it, well, it wasn't passed on, and, and that's due in part to the teachers in uh, uh, preparing people for First Communion, that's what it's usually taught, or it wasn't passed on in the home. We, most of us learned it in the home, I think, as a family rosary and so on. Were some of these mm -hmm. traditional forms of prayer somehow uh, rejected or looked down upon as not important enough, not mystical enough, or too formalized, or? Could be, could be. You know, I, I, I think you'd have to ask different people about mm -hmm. that. I haven't asked too much about that. I just know that it wasn't. Uh, I think somewhat TV squeezed a, a lot of things out of the home, a lot of the family uh, being together and praying together, sharing together, and so on. But for people mm -hmm. to seek other charismatic style forms mm -hmm. of prayer, as well as centering prayer, to become interested in in developing uh, methods of prayer, they must somehow have been dissatisfied in some way with the way they were. Yeah, I, I think perhaps we went through a stronger period of materialism after the Second World War when new prosperity came to the country and the people were caught up in that a great deal in business success, and getting ahead and so on. And then uh, there was a certain reaction to that. The young people who saw their parents struggling so much to get ahead materially and then not finding the happiness and fulfillment they, uh, and they growing up with all the material security and everything, and knowing the answer wasn't there, were looking for something more. And as I said, a lot of the Eastern masses came in at that time, and they looked to them because uh, their average priest or minister was not uh, offering ways of transcendent uh, prayer and meditation and so on. You helped to develop or developed uh, what you call centering prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and you lecture on that and, and give seminars and, and guide people through that experience. Can you just begin telling us about Centering Prayer? What is it, first of all? And we'll, we'll get into the details yeah. of it, actually. Yeah. The name is new, Centering Prayer, and it comes largely out of Thomas Merton. Uh, Thomas, uh, or Father Lewis as we call him, uh, would say that you know, the easiest way to come into the experience of God and communion with God is to go to your own center and pass through that center into the center of God. It was that reality which we mentioned before of how at every moment everything is coming forth from God. And so at the heart of our being is God there bringing us forth in his love. And then even more so, uh, we've been baptized into Christ, you know. And we're one with God, we're with Christ. And uh, as, as, as Christ said at the Last Supper, you know, uh, he who loves me and keeps my commandments, the Father and I will come and make our dwelling in him. So God dwells in us at the center of our being. And uh, this prayer is just really basically just turning to that center, being there in love, enjoying God, and letting God enjoy us. Now this simple method of, of doing that goes back to the earliest times. When you just described that, you pointed toward yourself mm -hmm. in terms of a direction, uh, mm -hmm. that you're going to your center, mm -hmm. through your center, to God, to experience God. Was there another direction? Uh, do we go, do people go through something else? Were there other images that... Oh, sure. Definitely. Uh, 
we have here uh, many convents of perpetual adoration. Mm -hmm. If you watch the sisters there kneeling, or anyone kneeling, they're looking at the monstrance. You know, they're experiencing God, they're centering in God and the monstrance. That lovely scene which uh, the great Russian exarch Anthony Bloom loves to talk about from the life of the Cory of Oz about the old man, you know, who sat in the church all day, and the Cory of Oz came and said, what are you doing, you know, what are you doing? And, and he said, I look at him, and he looks at me. So he was centering in God. Our Orthodox brethren will often center in an icon. They'll mm -hmm. stand before the icon and just look into the face of the Christ. Mm -hmm. So this, mm -hmm. you're describing now the images that people have, the symbols That's right. people have that, that helps them. Yeah, and this prayer uh, has in the past been called like the prayer of the heart. God dwelling in the heart, you know, or the prayer of simple regard, the prayer of silence. Uh, I like the image of center because it's almost an imageless image. You try to go to the center and you go deeper and deeper and deeper and, and you're never there in a sense. Okay, well let me ask you, is centering prayer imageless? I mean, do you, is that what you encourage in your... You don't encourage images or imagelessness because you're still involved in yourself and method and so on if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. What you're doing in prayer is your being to God. Huh? Okay. But we do have to use some image. That's the way we human beings function. And uh, people will find different images helpful. As I say in the Orthodox tradition, the icon, the presence, it's their tradition. Or the people in perpetual adoration, you know. But uh, the center, it, for many of us, is a good image because it just kind of leaves us free to be to God. See? And that, that's the thing we want to be, just simply be to God. So the, in a way, the best images of prayer, the one which God used so much in the Old Testament and in the New, is the image of a couple in love. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, at first, they got to do a lot of talking, get to know each other, you know? And each are talking about themselves a lot. And then they begin to quite listen more to the other. Huh? And then their response is more to the other's goodness and beauty and so on. And then as it goes on, you know, words are not adequate. There's more and more times just being together. Huh? And one of the, the beautiful memories of my, when I was a little boy, I used to spend the summers on my family's farm in Kansas. And I can remember in the evenings, uh, I would sit for hours on the top step of the stoop. And my grandmother and grandfather would be on the porch swing. Sometimes granddad would be reading the paper, grandma would be knitting or something, but as it got dark, they'd lay that aside. And sometimes they'd say nothing or they'd say a few things. But I felt so wonderful there. Mm -hmm. And I realized now what was happening was this tremendous love between them was embracing me. And I was just in this, this wonderful climate of love. And, and so that's why as love grows, you know, you're just to the other. And you're nourished by that. And mm -hmm. it's so fulfilling and all. And that's where prayer comes to. And, uh, well, uh, to enter into that kind of prayer, uh, we have to go through a development. And, uh, but even then, we need something to kind of keep us there. See, and that's what the method of centering prayer is. It's a simple method of just staying in that place of love. I can't help but think of the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy comes from Kansas and has always had a longing to return, return home to her family. But I wanted to mention something else. The point you mentioned about this loving couple, mm prayer described as a loving couple. I remember a um, Benedictine monk once being asked by a reporter, please define prayer. Mm. And he said, there's no such a thing as prayer. There's only a human being trying to relate to God. Mm -hmm. And that struck me very powerfully when he said that, that there's not a thing. Yeah, no, no, it's not a thing. It's, it's, it's a whole life. It's a whole But I think a lot being, of people think of it as a thing, yeah, thing, a thing you do, you do or right. a thing you say, sure. a form of words that you... Right. And it's a, a compartmentalized into a thing, another mm -hmm. object almost in life. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, first of all, God speaks to us. Somehow we know, whether, you know, from our parents or experience in life or something, that there is a God. We have to know that He exists. And that in some way He loves us and cares for us. So then we start talking to him. Mm -hmm. And at first the talking is very self-centered, you know, like an adolescent, all my needs and this, that, and the other things. Are. And, uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, as he takes care of me, I, I, I begin to quiet down, let him talk, you know, and listen to him a bit. And, th and then a relationship grows, you know. And uh, traditionally, in the West, uh, in our tradition, uh, they've summed this up in four 
Latin words. They usually just speak of lexio. When they say lexio, they mean this whole tradition. And uh, the word lexio, strictly speaking, means reading. But it, it always meant much more than that. Mm -hmm. It was lexio divina. It was reading the divine. Now, the primary place where we read the divine where is the scriptures. Huh? I no longer call you servants but friends because I've made known to you all the fathers may know to me, that call to friendship, say, that we're the sons and daughters of the book. We have this tremendous privilege. But God speaks to us through everything. He speaks to me now through you, through this, this you know, tremendously beautiful world we're surrounded mm -hmm. with here. Right. You know, uh, he speaks to us through uh, all the artistic creations and all the, all the things that are being accomplished in our creation. So he's, we read God in all these things. Say. He speaks to us. And then uh, meditatio. Now, meditatio here, uh, again, it, we can't just translate it meditation because uh, depending where we're coming from, we have rather specific ideas of meditation. And we can talk more about that later. But uh, in this sense, it meant just letting that, what we've heard from God, really come alive in us. Connell Newman had a good expression where he said, um, we must let a notional ascent become a real ascent. Mm -hmm. Now first we, we have the ideas and we say, yes, we believe them, of course God has told us. But as we really get in touch with them, we say, yeah, a whole being says, yes, that's it. Say, we really get the word. There, some kind of a, experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, yeah. we know. Yeah. And then comes a ratio, prayer, in the sense, uh, here they mean it, uh, in this tradition, of the response to that. You know, you suddenly realize how good God is and you praise Him, or, or you suddenly realize how sinful you are and you beg God's mercy, or you suddenly realize, you know, how good God's been to you and you thank Him, or you suddenly realize how needy we are and you beg for the need of, of our brothers and sisters or ourselves and so on. This kind of prayer that really comes out of, we've heard something, and it's really, and we know it now and we mm. respond to it. See? But then the fourth step of this they call contemplatio, a contemplation. Uh, it, it means really just, you know, being the state, just being with. Khan is with, you know, and a state of being with this, this Templar, this, this, this place of God. Mm -hmm. So being with God. But before all of that, yeah. you mentioned a God who is loving and caring. Yeah. And I'm wondering about those people who, and a God who speaks through all things. Mm -hmm. and in all things, and that the voices of creation and the voices mm -hmm. of other people and the voices of a, a child or the voices of even some suffering in life where God can speak through all of this. People who, whose understanding of God is limited to uh, a judge or yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, because of their background, parental teaching or whatever, they somehow have a fear of God that is not the fear of the Old Testament, an awe, and a wonderment mm -hmm. at creation and God's ways, but a sense of uh, terror at God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's you know, where the, the responsibility is with us who have been privileged to come to know God as He truly is in His great loving care, to know that He did make us to, to share in His happy life, uh, to bring that to others by really loving them, pouring out the divine love on them, and, and, and giving the witness of our joy. You know, as they said, see how these Christians, see how they love each other, you know, really care for each other. They're sacraments of God's love for each other. And any time we find somebody who's, who's hurting and fearing and so on, I think the first thing we have to ask is, have I loved this person enough? Have I been, you know, am I really a sacrament of God's love to them? You describe that, that experience in Kansas of being yeah. embraced by the love of your grandparents. Mm -hmm. And that must have led you into a deeper understanding of God's God's love. I'm sure it did, yeah. That you know, image. not a reflective understanding, mm -hmm. but just a, a knowing what it is to be in the embrace of love. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that when you were open mm -hmm. to the spiritual tra traditions and you began to mm -hmm. seek, you were almost ready to welcome a God that you had experienced on a human level through the yeah, love of, yeah. of your grandparents. Well, that, that's, you know, the first place a child should experience the divine love is the love of their mother and their father. Mm -hmm. You know, God has presented himself as father and as mother, too, in the scriptures. You know, so the mother and father are the first sacraments, and that's so sad when a child doesn't have a really loving mother and father. Mm -hmm. And that leaves a deep wound that needs a lot of healing. And that's the role of spiritual mothers and fathers, you know, especially, you know, we who are called to be fathers, spiritual fathers of the Christian community. We should, first of all, be lovers, really loving. 
and a sacrament of, the, of God's love. If you're using images of God, I'm just wondering how many people, uh, God is lover, mm -hmm. uh, God in creation, yeah. uh, God in divine reading, a sense of uh, just the word, mm -hmm. scripture and other reading, um, God is mother. Yeah. Uh, images that I don't think most people uh, associate with God. Yeah, or, and that's why, well, see, uh, first of all, God speaks to us, huh? and we ha but we have to listen. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the place where prayer has to start is listening. It does, uh, which means, you know, sitting out and letting creation speak to you, or sitting down with the scriptures each day. And that's why the first step is lexio. It's it's the listening, the uh -huh. listening. The first step is 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 letting him reveal himself, his true self. And we all have the problem. We come to people with prejudices. You know, sometimes when I travel, I wear the Roman collar. And sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. And the different ways people relate to me with or without the collar, mm -hmm. uh, because they have prejudices, good or bad, in regards to the collar of the priest and so on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we have our prejudices in regards to God. And if we're not going to, you know, if we're going to insist on hanging on to our prejudices, mm -hmm then a true relation can never relate. I can never truly relate with you if I don't give you a chance for you to reveal your, your true self, your beauty, your goodness to me. That's startling. I never thought of, we were even talking recently about prejudices against other nationalities mm -hmm. and other ethnic groups, but I never thought of having a prejudice against God, but it sounds so true to me now as you say it. Oh, sure. If but, somebody thinks of God as a stern judge, that's a prejudice. Mm -hmm. And limits God to being only in that role. Yeah, unless you... you you know, let, uh, you, you, in fact, you don't have a relation with God, you have your relation with your false image, mm -hmm. a real idol in a certain sense. Can you experience the God of love without experiencing some sense of human love? God can break through. He certainly can. The ordinary way is the first sacrament of God's love is, is human love. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the ordinary way. But God is not limited, never limited. And there are people whose first experience of love has been a charismatic experience when suddenly they you know, just bowled over by this divine love, or, or a creative experience, or, or, or another human person oftentimes, but, or just in the silence, reading the scriptures, and suddenly they, they see that God loves them, mm -hmm. so loves them that he gave his own son. Those extraordinary experiences of the spirit mm -hmm. of, that are described in, in almost indescribable uh, yeah. experiences, but described nonetheless as best we can, that yeah. uh, almost invade life at times. Uh, and most people have had them at one time or another, too, you know, uh, not able to identify them oftentimes because there was nobody to check them with there. Uh, they hadn't communicated with somebody else who had similar experiences and perhaps had a, a theological context for them. So when you mentioned, for example, your, your aunt, I believe it was, with mm -hmm. the rosary, that prayer form for her may have been just an ordinary prayer form but because of her experience with it was a deep mystical. Sure. So she never probably had anybody that told her, well, you're praying oh, no. in deep prayer. If I prayer. told her she was a contemplative, she'd tell me I was screwy. You know? <laughs> but uh, she was. But, but uh, there are more, yeah. more contemplatives than... Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. But there are people, see, who have come to the point where they've had the experience and they want to just abide in the quiet with God. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones uh, for whom centering prayer is effective. Or for those who've gone to the East and perhaps have learned transcendental meditation or Zen meditation or different kinds of yoga meditation, and they want to come back to their own tradition. Do we have this in our tradition? We do. Mm -hmm. All the way back to the earliest times. Say. And uh, what we've done in Centering Prayer is taken the simple method which John Cashin brought in the fourth century from the deserts of Egypt, from the old spiritual fathers there, to the West, mm -hmm. which has been constantly taught in the monasteries in the West and which you find like in the Cloud of Unknowing, which is a fairly well-known Christian classics. And we've taken that and presented it in a very simple way so that people can easily learn and begin to use it in their life. We're going to talk about those the simple ways, yeah. I hope, and some of the obstacles in our next, next session, but uh, how did you come upon this centering prayer for yourself? Well, I learned it... Uh, in some ways, see, I was, uh, I was already having contemplative prayer experience, largely through looking at the tabernacle, uh, I would sit in church and just look at the tabernacle, commune with the Lord. And, and uh, that's where I learned contemplative prayer, just spending time there. Uh, but uh, when I became, uh, entered the monastery, 
uh, my spiritual father, uh, Abbot Edmund, God bless him, beautiful, beautiful man, uh, taught me. Uh, well, he validated what I was doing and, and told me, you know, I could do it anywhere and just to use uh, the holy name to stay in the presence. And uh, so he really taught me in a rather informal but very traditional way of how to remain in this prayer, which he called the prayer of the will, which is another name, the, the act of love of the will is the thing by which we, we transcend, we enter into God and open our way, ourselves to God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I learned it from him and, and uh, you know, it was part of my life. So this is something mm -hmm. you can learn. Yes, uh, oh definitely, we, <laughs> you know. Is that a natural, inbuilt in the relationship with God, something that will come to you if you give it, it enough will, time? It will, it will, but, but uh, knowing that, uh, I've had the experience oftentimes, for example, teaching older people the centering prayer, mm -hmm. and after we've gone through it, they say, oh, I've been doing that for years. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. so it is kind of, you come to it naturally. Uh -huh. It's very nice to be confirmed from the tradition, mm -hmm. but also for people who've been kind of stuck, they've learned like one kind of, of um, discursive meditation, and they work hard at it regularly in great fidelity, for them to learn that there is another way, mm -hmm. you know, and just to be able to, uh, to give them that little method to open out to that other way Maybe is very helpful. In the last two minutes here, you can just quickly yeah. respond to this quote from Father Lewis, uh, Father Merton. Um, it's a risky thing to pray, and the danger is that our very prayers get between God and us. The greatest thing in prayer is not to pray, but to go directly to God. Yeah. A little later on, he says, stop praying. Pray, yeah. I, and he's talking about people who, uh, you know, for, for whom prayer is saying things or doing discursive exercises, mm -hmm. fulfilling different obligations and on. And, and otherwise, they're concerned about, and even in Sunday prayer, you can get concerned about the method. You know, and that's all got to, what you want is just God. Mm -hmm. Almost making the method God sure. rather than... And, and one of the, see, the tricky things is we always want to be right. And so pretty soon we're, we're watching ourselves, see if I'm praying right. And uh -huh. we're all caught up in praying uh -huh. instead of being just simply with God, which is what prayer is all about. That's back to that so competitive element that's within us. That competitive the, or, you know, or just being right, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that, that false self that, that we build up, that you've got to do everything right and got to be, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Right and so on, yeah. Well, that's right or wrong, we're going to continue on in our discussion about prayer and centering prayer specifically in our next session. Thanks, Great, Basil. good. Thanks, John. Okay.